Welcome back. Today we get to study Mosiah chapter 1, 2, and 3, and I hope you're as excited about this as I am. King Benjamin's address is one of my all-time favorite passages in the Book of Mormon. In fact, I had an amazing experience about a year ago when these exact chapters, discussing them over lunch with an evangelical minister friend of mine. I do a lot of interfaith work that started when I was in Tennessee and it's continued here in Utah. And this particular friend is a pastor from Alabama that comes out to do some interfaith work with me about every year. And one time he was coming out and I said, hey, can we get together for lunch? I want to talk to you about King Benjamin's address. He's familiar enough with the Book of Mormon to know who I was talking about. And I said, I think you'll really like what, we have, what he has to say. King Benjamin is about as close to an evangelical Nephite as I think you could want to meet. That intrigued him. So we went to a Mexican restaurant in downtown Salt Lake City and just ate and talked Book of Mormon, me and this wonderful evangelical friend of mine. By the end of the conversation, he was like, wow, yes, King Benjamin would make a good evangelical Nephite. He agreed with the doctrine that we taught. And from, a, from an interfaith perspective, any time that Latter-day Saints and evangelicals start discussing things, the conversation tends to go towards grace and wondering, how are we saved? What role do works and grace play in that salvation? What expectation does God have of us, if any? Uh, and honestly, I think these, pa these passages in King Benjamin uh, are some of the best places for we Latter-day Saints to understand our faith and to be able to explain it better to those that we sometimes speak past. So that's the eventual destination today, to spend time with King Benjamin understanding salvation and how it works particularly understanding grace and works in that equation. But before we get there, we need to pick up where we left off last time in the smallest of the small plates of Nephi. Our focus at that time was on the passing of the plates, or as we've tried to liken it to us, the passing on of our faith to those that we love. And we saw it go from Jacob, Nephi to Jacob, to Enos, to Jerem, to Omni, and then all those other prophets until it, well, prophets, put it in quotes, I suppose, uh, those other writers, until the, it got to Amalekai, who realized that it had hit ground bottom and needed to get back up and running. So he found King Mosiah and King Benjamin and passed the plates on to Benjamin. Now, before we get to King Benjamin's life-changing address, I want to spend just a few minutes on that final passing of the baton that we see today. Because Mosiah chapter 1 is an incredible continuation of this passing on of faith in the form of the gold plates that we saw last time that we studied together. In Mosiah chapter 1 verse 2, in fact Mosiah 1 is an amazing chapter on the importance of scripture. He talks about passing this responsibility on to his sons. The kingship is going to pass to Mosiah, but the responsibility for Maintaining faith is going to go to all of King Benjamin's sons. So in chapter 1, verse 2, this language should sound familiar from what we saw in 1 Nephi chapter 1, in Enos chapter 1. I guess there's only one chapter in Enos, right? Mosiah chapter 1, verse 2, King Benjamin caused that they, his three sons, should be taught in all the language of his fathers. Again, this isn't just linguistics, this is scriptural language. So just as Nephi was taught in the language of his father, as Enos mentioned being taught in the language of his father, and blessed be his name for it, these sons are also taught in the language of his fathers, this scriptural spiritual tongue, that thereby they might become men of understanding. That phrase is going to be repeated later in Alma when it talks about the sons of Mosiah. So another couple generations later, that they too were men of understanding. And it defines that in terms of scripture study. It says that they were men of understanding for they searched the scriptures diligently that they might know the word of God. So here, same idea. King Benjamin's sons, Mosiah, Helaman, and Helaman, are all taught in the language of their father so they could be men of understanding real understanding, which is typically centered in the heart, scripturally speaking, even more than the mind, that they might know concerning the prophecies which had been spoken by the mouths of their fathers, which were delivered them by the hand of the Lord. So again, this is the ability to read and understand scripture, perhaps the most important language that we can really pass on to our children. Verse 3, again, specifically speaking of Scripture, King Benjamin also taught them concerning the records which were engraven on the plates of brass, saying, My sons, I would that ye should remember that were it not for these plates, 
which contain these records and these commandments. Notice, by the way, he's distinguishing between the plates and the records. Moroni will do this at the end of the book. The, the plates are gold, but who really cares about the material they were, they were written on? The record, the actual engravings, this, these prophecies and revelations that were contained on these plates, that's what's going to be of greatest importance. So again, we'll see it very clearly when Mormon and Moroni are about to bury these plates and distinguishing between physical object, plate, and spiritual message, record. But this is, as, as far as I can tell, is the first time that you really start to see this in the Book of Mormon, with King Benjamin differentiating between the two. Notice also, he's starting to mention, what would it be like without them? President Nelson recently encouraged all of us to ponder, what would our lives be like without the restoration? In this case, what would their lives be like without the record? Now recall, King Benjamin is one generation removed, so his sons are only two generations removed, from the people of Mosiah, Benjamin's father, King Mosiah I, separating from the land of Nephi, and going to a new place that they discovered, which was the land of Zarahemla. You remember we saw this back in at the end of the book of Omni, that when they went there, they discovered a people that had also come out of Jerusalem, and yet they didn't bring scriptures with them. So you have this group of people with scripture, meeting a group of people without scripture, and seeing the difference between these two societies as they merge. And so when King Benjamin mentions to his sons, what would our life have been like without scripture? Well, they have a very clear group to compare things to. And if you recall what it said back in the book of Omni, they denied the being of their creator. They had lost much of their language. Again, that's probably more scriptural language than anything. They couldn't understand the people of Nephi. That's probably both linguistic and spiritual, to be honest. So here, again, this is a good exercise for each of us. What would life have been like or would be like without the word of God as a part of it. As King Benjamin says in Mosiah chapter 1 verse 3, were it not for these plates which contain these records and these commandments, we must have suffered in ignorance, even at this present time, not knowing the mysteries of God. It's not so much that it's the difference between suffering and non-suffering. Life will always contain its share of adversity. So the suffering will be there. It's a matter of are we suffering in ignorance or are we suffering with a knowledge of, the, of God? Do you remember back in 1 Nephi chapter 1, those first couple of verses, when Nephi says that he talked about his many afflictions. So he was suffering, but in the same, in the same breath, this is still chapter 1, verse 1, first phrase of the Book of Mormon, really. Nevertheless, I've been highly favored by the, of the Lord in all my days, because I had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God. One of the greatest mysteries of God is why we suffer at all if we have a Father in heaven who loves us. And yet scripture helps us understand. That's theophany. That's the problem of evil as it's called in academic circles or philosophical theological circles. It's, we, again, we will all suffer, but suffering in ignorance usually comes because we don't see God's hand behind that suffering or within that suffering or purposes from him for that suffering. So as we learn the mysteries of God contained in the records of scripture, our suffering can be with eyes a little more open to the purposes of God through them all. Verse four continues this mental experiment on what would life be like without scripture. For it were not possible that our father Lehi could have remembered all these things to have taught them to his children, except it were for the help of these plates. As I think it was Elder Maxwell that said that scripture extends our memory. It doesn't all have to be ourselves and our own personal experience. It can be the experiences of other people who have preceded us. That was actually one of the things that convinced Nephi to finally move forward on this unthinkable commandment of God to slay Laban. He realized that there was no chance of keeping commandments if they didn't know commandments and that there would be no way of knowing commandments without having those commandments written before them on those plates of brass. So similarly, in verse 4, 
We have to have these, otherwise there's no way of remembering everything. I've had this conversation with many a return missionary, asking them if they know the scriptures or know the gospel as well as they did on their missions. And seldom do they answer affirmatively. It's because we're in them all the time, teaching them, studying them, preaching from them, that our memory seems to be best served. They start sticking because we're in them all the time. This preserved memory is one of the great blessings of Scripture and one of the reasons that we need to be in it much more frequently than we often are. Again, he's speaking of scriptural language, but also the specific written language of the Egyptians in verse 4. For he having been taught in the language of the Egyptians, therefore he could read these engravings. And, next step, teach them to his children. Pass the baton every time. That thereby they could teach them to their children. This is the long game that we're playing. And so fulfilling the commandments of God, even down to this present time. Again, verse 5. Were it not for these plates, for these things which have been kept and preserved by the hand of God, that we might read and understand of his mysteries, and have his commandments always before our eyes. I love that phrase. The scriptures keep God's commandments always before our eyes. It helps us recall and remember I remember something that I learned from one of the first people that taught me how to teach the gospel. He said he'd been observing a class and giving some feedback to this teacher. And the teacher had had this incredible chalkboard display. This is in the days before whiteboards. And it was amazing. All the things that they discussed all day in that class were there on the chalkboard. At the end of the class, the students all left. And this trainer went up to the chalkboard, erased it, kind of shook the chalk out of the eraser into the the chalk tray and then blew it into this cloud of chalk dust. And then he said to this teacher in training, there went your lesson. Everything that those students learned was beautifully preserved on the board, which we just erased. And how much of it was centered in the scriptures themselves? How much did they mark? What did they underline? What did they write in their margin? Knowing that eventually they will return to that page. They'll never return to this chalkboard as it was during class. But they will return to the written word of God. If that's where we can preserve the truths that we learn, underlining, marking, circling, writing in the margin, if you use the electronic version as so many of us do now, to be able to highlight and underline, to to code, to note, to tag, to write our own cross-references, to link things through Scripture. Scripture is something permanent and portable. It is something we will see again. It is always before our eyes. He continues in verse 5, Without that gift, without having the written word, Even our fathers would have dwindled in unbelief, and we should have been like unto our brethren, the Lamanites. Now, this is an interesting admission from a Nephite king. We're no different from our brethren. We're no better. They're no worse. What really makes the difference between righteous Nephites and wicked Lamanites is a knowledge and understanding of the word of God. If it weren't for that, we would be no different than they are. In fact, he says, end of verse 5, those Lamanites know nothing concerning these things. Again, that's, he, he has a, an even closer group to describe in those Mulekites, the people of Zarahemla, who knew nothing concerning these things since they hadn't brought scripture until Mosiah had them when he came. Or notice this phrase, or even do not believe them when they are taught them. There's something about scripture that isn't just a matter of, I now have preserved ancient truth from God, but having scripture in some way prepares our mind and heart to be open to ongoing truth from God. The better I know written scripture, the more prepared I am to receive the oral scripture that comes from prophets, seers, and revelators in our day. Sadly, those Lamanites not only knew nothing from the past, They weren't open to anything for their future. Verse 6, O my sons, I would that ye should remember that these sayings are true. These records are true. 
The plates of Nephi, which came, contain the records and the sayings of our fathers from the time they left Jerusalem until now, they are true. Three testimonies born in one simple verse, which again is a repetition of 1 Nephi chapter 1, where Nephi bears his testimony of the truths that he is writing upon these records himself. As I said in our last, in our last experience in Omni, when Amalekai is starting a new, kind of rebooting the Book of Mormon, he's going to a man, King Mosiah, that's a lot like Lehi, and a man, King Benjamin, who's a lot like Nephi. And sure enough, King Benjamin here is beginning this record of his in, similar, in a similar vein that, as Nephi did. He says it again at the end of verse 6. They are true. We can know of their surety because we have them before our eyes. There's something marvelous about the, the physicality, the, the presence, the permanence of Scripture. President Hinckley said this often. Many Latter-day Prophets have talked about the physicality of the Book of Mormon. It's here. It's present. It is before our eyes. So it has to be explained in some way. It's amazing to watch those who have left the church or are fighting against the church. As Elder Holland has said before, they're going to have to go over or under or around or through the Book of Mormon because it is here. No wonder they try so desperately uh, grasping at possibilities of the Spaldian theory or uh, the view of the Hebrews or this new book about the War of 1812. The book is old, but the concerns about it are, new, are newer. The Book of Mormon is before our eyes. We have to explain it in some way. And in all the study that I've done of both Joseph's explanation and the explanations of everyone who's attacked him ever since, I'm most convinced by and converted to Joseph's simple explanation that this is the word of God as translated by the gift and power of God. It is before my eyes and I have to explain it somehow. That to me is the most simple and convincing explanation that I've heard. Joseph's. Verse 7. Now my sons, I would that ye should remember to search them diligently that we may profit thereby. Again, similar to Nephi's language. Search these things. Feast upon the words of Christ. They'll tell you all things that you should do. Liken them to yourself, that they might be for your profit and learning. Here's a father concerned for his sons, but also a king concerned for his people. Remember these things. They're right in front of you. They're always before your eyes. Remember to search them. Having the plates present, is insufficient. The record upon them must be remembered and kept before your eyes so that it can profit you. And I would that you should keep the commandments of God, that you may prosper in the land according to the promises which the Lord made unto our fathers. Many more things, verse 8, King Benjamin taught his sons, which are not written in this book. I would love to know what those other things were, but I think what he's written sufficeth me to make the point that scripture is such a key, that this is the greatest single object that the Nephite civilization possesses and passes on in order to pass on the faith of their fathers. Now, let's shift from King Benjamin's message to his sons about scripture to his message to his people about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. This is the conversation that I had in that Mexican restaurant. Talk about a perfect scenario. Good Mexican food, incredible scripture, an amazing conversation partner that didn't automatically believe it, but had to have some persuasive power from the text itself to help him see the beauty of what King Benjamin was teaching. To set the stage, can we start from the end, at least the end of the beginning of his discourse? Uh, this is going to be something we'll pick up with next week when we get to the second half of King Benjamin's address. But if you look at Mosiah chapter 4, we're going to study 1, 2, 3 today. But the way 4 begins actually puts a conclusion on the experience that M King Benjamin's people have had in the previous two chapters, 2 and 3. So notice in chapter 4 what has occurred to them. In fact, be thinking, if this is the response to this message that those people had, Will my response to that message be anything similar? 
verse 1 of chapter 4. Now it came to pass that when King Benjamin had made an end of speaking the words which had been delivered unto him by the angel of the Lord. So he's just taught Mosiah chapter 2 and chapter 3, which we'll see in a moment. That he cast his eyes round about on the multitude and notice their response. Behold, they had fallen to the earth for the fear of the Lord had come upon them. There is this sense of reverence, of respect, my favorite word, of awe towards God because of the things that King Benjamin has taught them. They had viewed themselves in their own carnal state even less than the dust of the earth. No wonder they had fallen to the earth. No wonder the fear of God had come upon them. They saw themselves for what they really were. And compared to what God intended to make of them, there was a huge gap. And that gap was haunting them. They all cried aloud with one voice, this perfect unity among these people, saying, Oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins and our hearts may be purified. Now that's their desire. And we'll see if that desire is fulfilled next time in chapter 4, 5, and 6. But notice again what's been happening to them because of what King Benjamin taught them in chapter 2 and 3. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth and all things, who shall come down among the children of men. So not only is it fear that they feel, but it's hope that their hearts have been infused with. They're such a powerful combination. This is what, like Jacob talking about, because of faith and great anxiety. They're feeling both. They're feeling that hope, that faith that comes through a knowledge of Jesus Christ, but also that great anxiety, that fear of the Lord, because I know I've fallen short of his perfect expectations for us. In some ways, this is the pillars of eternity that Elder McConkie always talked about. Creation, fall, atonement. That in this creation phase, we don't even know how much better we should be. We don't realize how far from God we happen to be. We're innocent in Eden, naked and unashamed of that exposure to the all-seeing eye of God. And then things come, an understanding of ourselves in comparison to God comes, and we've fallen. And in that stage, this fear of the Lord tends to come upon us. And yet trusting in the atonement, having faith, believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who shall come down among the children of men, Understanding that is what gives us hope to move forward. We no longer look longingly back to Eden as if that was the solution to all of our woes. But we look forward to the atonement where Jesus Christ can bridge that gap between who we are and who he is and who he wants us to become. This really is the faith and great anxiety that need to come together to bring about this mighty change of heart that they're experiencing. As soon as they've said those words in verse 3, after they had spoken these words, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they were filled with joy. Compare that to the fear they felt in verse 1. Having received a remission of their sins and having peace of conscience because of the exceeding faith which they had in Jesus Christ who should come. It was King Benjamin's discourse, his words, that facilitated, catalyzed this incredible conversion for these people. And it all happened, as verse 3 clarifies, because of the exceeding faith which they had in Jesus Christ. You remember Enos' experience, which is so similar to this? He goes out to hunt beasts in the wilderness. The words of his father weigh upon his heart. He begins to see himself for who he really is. I'm sure the fear of the Lord was, engaged, was part of that wrestle that he was engaged in. And yet he too receives a remission of his sins and his guilt is swept away. How is it done, he asks. The answer to him is the same as the answer in verse 3. Because of thy faith in Jesus Christ. My question then is what did King Benjamin say? If this change of heart occurred because of King Benjamin's words then what were those words? And how could they have that profound effect upon these people? I'm a teacher. I work in words. And my greatest hope for my students, my children, 
is that they too have some version of this experience where because of the words which have been spoken unto them, they will have faith in Jesus Christ to the point that fear is replaced by joy and peace and a remission of their sins. That's why we do what we do with our words. So how did King Benjamin do it? Before we get to his actual words, can we rewind the clock and see what got him and his people to this point? If we do that, I think we'll see ourselves in this story even more clearly. Recall what I already said, that in the book of Omni, King Benjamin's people are one generation removed from this merging of cultures, the people of Nephi and the people of Zarahemla, people with scripture and a knowledge of God and people without scripture or a knowledge of God. Sounds a lot like the church today as far as massive amounts of converts coming into the church at any given time. So that in a general conference, and we often see King Benjamin's address in general conference kinds of analogies. Here we have this mixed multitude of lifelong members and more recent converts. People who perhaps feel like they've already received this change of heart and people that are hoping to receive it themselves. In reality, we all need to experience these things. But to see what King Benjamin is doing with this mixed multitude is fascinating. We usually tend to picture King Benjamin as an old man. He is in these chapters. But again, rewind the clock and see what got him to this point in the Words of Mormon. Words of Mormon chapter 1 verse 12, Mormon reminds us, reflecting back on this time period, concerning this King Benjamin. He had somewhat of contentions among his own people. That may be a reflection of these two civilizations, these two societies coming together and trying to become one. Verse 13, the armies of the Lamanites came down against the land of Nephi to battle against his people. He fought with his own arm with a sword of Laban. This is not just a, a gray-haired old man on top of a tower. This is a warrior. This is a veteran who knows what it's like to fight with the strength of his own arm and to fight with the strength of the Lord on behalf of his people. He's now going to do that with words rather than weapons. Verse 14, in the strength of the Lord. So in verse 13, it was the strength of his own arm. In 14, it's the strength of the Lord. Those two really do need to come together. They did contend against their enemies until they'd slain many thousands of the Lamanites. And it came to pass that they did contend against the Lamanites until they had driven them out of all the lands of their inheritance. So in some ways, before King Benjamin is able to establish spiritual peace, kind of this vertical peace between God and humanity, he has labored, put his own life in danger to establish a measure of horizontal peace. Then in verse 15, Notice there are false Christs. Verse 16, there are false prophets and false preachers and teachers among the people. And yet those people are punished and their mouths are shut. This is not only a time of contention. This is also a time of dissension. This is a time of apostasy, of opposition, of falsehood and deception. Again, it sounds a lot like our day. Middle of verse 16, after there having been much contention and many dissensions away unto the Lamanites, it came to pass that King Benjamin, with the assistance of the holy prophets who were among his people, are going to try to set things straight. So notice, in spite of all the king's efforts to shut the mouths of deceivers, of false Christs and false prophets and false preachers and false teachers, there were many dissensions away. Again, this is our day. As people attack the faith, I, I sometimes wonder if King Benjamin wished he could have given his discourse in a vacuum or that President Nelson can speak from a general conference pulpit with nothing else happening in the lives of his audience. But that's just not the case. We're in the midst of wars and rumors of wars. We're in the midst of contention and opposition, dissension away from the church of God, people coming in that need to be taught, people who had been taught and are leaving 
And in the midst of all of this swirl of emotions and challenges, King Benjamin brings his people together with a specific goal in mind. He's not alone in this. In verse 17, he was a holy man. He reigned over his people in righteousness. But there were many holy men in the land all of whom spoke the word of God with power and authority, including sharpness because of the stiff-neckedness of the people. And so in 18, with the help of these, what a blessing that King Benjamin is not the only voice in the wilderness, that there is a cloud of witnesses for them just as it is for us. But it required the labor of all the might of their body and the faculty of their whole soul to establish peace in the land. And it's in that moment I love that he wants to kind of have things just the way they need to be, as close as possible, before he passes the political baton onto his son, Mosiah. And then as one parting gift to his son, the new leader, but also to the people he has spent his lifetime serving and blessing, he wants to give them something, one last gift. And this describes his ultimate goal for this great discourse. It's in Mosiah chapter 1 right after he's given his hopes for his sons with scripture, verse 11, he lets them know, this kind of sneak peek, the hope he has for his people. Mosiah 1 verse 11, I shall give this people a name that thereby they may be distinguished above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of the land of Jerusalem. He knows of the scattering of Israel that's been taking place. But this name will distinguish them, not only from all others, but above all others. And this I do because they have been a diligent people in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Now, there's something here that I think would cause my evangelical friend a little bit of alarm. It's one thing to receive the name of Christ, to ask for it, to accept it in our lives, and thus receive the Savior's salvation. But do we have to put in the same breath because they've been a diligent people in in keeping the commandments of the Lord? Where do works factor in on this? Where is obedience in this equation of grace? Verse 12, he brings it up again. I give unto them a name that never shall be blotted out, except it be through transgression. Again, this is this, this toxic perfectionism, this works righteousness, this you have to earn your way to heaven that evangelicals are so afraid of as they perceive it in Latter-day Saints. There are many of us that perceive it in ourselves or in each other that also is a cause of concern. And yet to swing the pendulum to the opposite degree and completely eliminate the need for obedience, to not worry about transgression, is that the answer? Latter-day Saints would say no, and evangelicals would too. But what do we do with this? Again, preview of coming attractions, it's interesting that King King Benjamin's goal is to give them a name to distinguish them that will never be blotted out to become true Christians and at the same time to keep somewhere in the wings this need for diligence, obedience, an overcoming or repentance of transgression. How are we going to keep these two things together in a way that will bless us all? In verse 13, he even uses an interesting phrase, this highly favored people of the Lord, if they should fall into transgression and become a wicked and an adulterous people, the Lord will deliver them up that they may become weak like unto their brethren. Now notice the word adulterous. I don't think he was just being specific when it comes to sins of immorality. The Old Testament is full of talk of adultery that has nothing to do with infidelity to one's spouse and everything to do with infidelity towards God. Jeremiah talks about Israel and Judah as as prostitutes, as backsliding sisters that are cheating on their husband, who is the Lord. And so think about what we're going to talk about in, in kind of marriage terms, that when a Husband and wife are married. The wife tends to take upon herself the husband's name. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. There's the parallel that we're trying to follow. And so if we, the church, is the bride of Christ and we are taking upon ourselves his name, 
that name will never be blotted out except it be through transgression. Because if we transgress against that name and become a wicked and an adulterous people, we've cheated on him. We haven't kept our covenants with him. We have removed ourselves from the marriage. And there goes the name that he so kindly had given us. It's that kind of adultery, covenant infidelity, that King Benjamin is cautioning them against. Notice also what he said, without that covenant, we will become weak like unto our brethren. Just like he had said about his sons, that we will become no different from those spiritually weakened Lamanites if we don't have the word of God constantly before our eyes. It's those covenants that distinguish us from other people. In fact, it's what Samson said in the book of Judges. If I cut my hair, which in reality was just an outward sign of an inner commitment, if I cut my covenant, if I break my covenant with God, I shall become weak like any other person. That's Samson's phrase. King Benjamin's is very similar. So King Benjamin wants his sons with the scriptures and his people with the word of God that he would deliver to them to gain this covenant connection with Christ. In fact, chapter 1 blends these two together so beautifully. In explaining this to his sons, he gives them charge in verse 16 concerning the records, which he'd spoken to them about, records on the plates of brass, records on the plates of Nephi, the sword of Laban, which he had wielded in defense of his people, the Baal or director, the Liahona that had carried his fathers through the wilderness. But notice, in fact, what he says about the Liahona at the end of verse 16. Just a quick aside here. It led our fathers through the wilderness, which was prepared by the hand of the Lord, that thereby they might be led, every one according to the heed and diligence which they gave unto him. Now, if you hadn't been following along, you probably would have expected it as the pronoun at the end of verse 16. The Liahona only works according to the heed and diligence which we give unto it. But instead, he ties this ball or director to the hand of the Lord, he who prepared it, and said that it only worked as they gave heed and diligence to him. Not so much the gift, but the giver of the gift. Are we paying attention to him, trusting in him? Because then these directors, and in some ways everything that he said in that verse, the brass plates, the gold plates of Nephi, even the sword of Laban, if you couple that with the armor of God, the sword and the armor of God, our only offensive weapon, is the word of God and the spirit of God. And then the Liahona. So all of these beautiful symbols of God's word really tie us back to the source of that word, the word himself, which is Jesus, that we may give heed and diligence unto him. Verse 17, if we're unfaithful, there's that flip side of the adultery. If we're unfaithful, they did not prosper nor progress in their journey. They were driven back. They incurred the displeasure of God unto them. They were smitten with famine and sore afflictions. And the same will be true of us. So sons, be faithful to these words that I'm giving you. My people, as he's about to pivot from his family to his society, be faithful to the word of God, which has been given and which will continue to come among you. Chapter 2 of Mosiah then gives us some more background before the actual discourse begins. And yet this Preparation is key. If Words of Mormon gave us some even prior preparation to end dispute and dissension, to silence false Christs and false preachers and false teachers, to establish peace in the land, he then goes through an amazing amount of physical and spiritual preparation so that his people can have the life-changing experience he's hoping for them. Chapter 2, verse 1, for example, he tells his people to go up to the temple to hear the words which King Benjamin should speak unto them. Remember, Nephi had built a temple way back in chapter 5 of 2 Nephi. This must have been a new one. Amazing that everywhere that these Nephites went, they knew that there would need to be a temple. Abraham's that way in the Old Testament, by the way. Not with a full temple, but with an altar. 
Pay close attention in, in Genesis and almost everywhere Abraham goes, he makes sure that he can set up an altar there to connect with God. Here, a temple, the place of covenants, God's own house. This is a marriage and God is wanting to bring us across the threshold. And so this discourse is going to take place in that holiest of places. In verse 3 and 4, they bring the firstlings of their flocks. They offer sacrifice and burnt offerings according to the law of Moses. So there is this obedience to law, this self-sacrifice, this giving nature. I think often when we come to receive of God, what are we bringing to offer him? Remember, Amalekai says that back in the book of Omni. Come and partake of the salvation of God and also come and offer your whole souls as an offering unto him. So here they've come in the spirit of sacrifice. Verse 4, they give thanks to the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Jerusalem and delivered them from their enemies. So is the spirit of gratitude as well. They recognize that God has appointed just men to be their teachers and a just man to be their king. They recognize already the authority of the people that they've been learning from and are about to hear from in this moment. In verse 5, they all come together according to their families. Wives, sons, daughters, oldest to youngest, each family separate from one another. As Elder Bednar has said repeatedly, the greatest messages of God will come in our home. Perhaps no time we felt that more keenly than now. And all of those homes, verse 6, those tents are pitched with their door towards the temple. What is our focal point? What do we see in all of our outgoings and incomings? What a beautiful physical and spiritual preparation that he's asking these people to go through as they are now prepared to sit at his feet and learn of his words. In verse 7, he even makes sure that they'll be able to hear him well. Again, more physical preparation because he builds a tower. Towers, by the way, are beautiful symbolic things in Scripture as far as watchmen on the tower from the book of Ezekiel, for example. And then in verse 8, knowing that the tower, that elevation, yes, would project his voice to a greater distance, but still not sufficient for all the surrounding multitudes. He also makes sure that his words are written in verse 8 and sent forth among the people who were not under the sound of his voice. I would add to that, those written words would not just be a blessing for those not under the sound of his voice. They would be a blessing for those who were under the sound of his voice because it would keep those words always before their eyes. There's a whole scholarly literature about the difference between the written and the oral, and each has its own gifts. To the group that is close enough to this tower to hear King Benjamin's words, there can be this moment, this experience, this, this surrounded by the words that they are hearing and feeling in the very moment. But they can also have the added blessing after the fact of being able to have those words before their eyes, to pour over them and ponder them. Things that are very difficult to do in the moment when additional words keep coming forth. All of that physical preparation is combined with some beautiful spiritual preparation on King Benjamin's part. In chapter 3, verse 4, this angel that gave the words to King Benjamin, and that should tell us something too. The source behind this, his goal was divine. His preparation was both temporal and spiritual. The source of his message was purely divine. An angel of the Lord had given it unto him. And he gave it to him because of what it says in chapter 3, verse 4. For the Lord hath heard thy prayers, speaking to King Benjamin, and hath judged of thy righteousness, and hath sent me to declare unto thee that thou mayest rejoice, and that thou mayest declare unto thy people, that they may also be filled with joy. You have permission to teach these truths to your people because you've been praying for it and you've been living worthily of that gift. So rejoice and let your people rejoice too. You are permitted to teach these things. I was struck by something that Henry B. I, President Henry B. Eyring once said. 
I've heard similar things from Elder Richard G. Scott. This concern, this caution, this sacred reverence towards the truths of God to the point that both President Eyring and Elder Scott shared in a message of theirs. I have been praying for permission to teach some of the things that I want to teach today. That's amazing to me that an apostle of God would still be seeking permission. Sacred things should be handled sacredly. And for them to ask God, you often will, will see this when somebody wants to share a story that involves another person and they'll say, by permission, that I have the person who this story comes from. I have their permission to share this with the rest of you. Well, to treat sacred things like that, that this truth belongs to God. He is the original source of this message. And I've been pleading with him for permission to be able to teach these things to you. I remember really being touched by that when President Irene and Elder Scott talked in those terms that we have God's approval to learn the things that their servant would have us know. And King Benjamin was given that same approval divinely. Now everything's in place. King Benjamin is spiritually prepared with permission granted. The people are physically prepared, tents towards the temple, tower built, scribes at hand. The people are prepared spiritually. They've offered sacrifice, given thanks to God, it, together with their family, ready to learn from a servant of God who has proven himself throughout his life to have nothing but their best interests at heart. And so he begins. Chapter 2, verse 9, he begins this discourse. My brethren, all ye that have assembled yourselves together, that you can hear my words which I shall speak unto you this day. Now, he interrupts himself. For I have not commanded you to come up hither to trifle with the words which I shall speak. There is a tone to every message. It's one of the things that makes emailing or texting so difficult. Maybe that's why we use emojis so many times. I don't know if there is a, I'm not here to trifle emoji. That we're, that I'm not winking here. This isn't LOL or take my words with a grain, grain of salt. This is no sarcasm. All joking aside, I have not commanded you to come up hither to trifle with the words which I shall speak. It's actually a pet peeve of mine. I try to control it. But it's a pet peeve of mine how often people begin their messages in sacrament meeting with trifling words. As if a joke is the only way to break the ice with a congregation. As if we needed to hear the story behind how the bishopric asked you to speak and how nervous you were and that this message is more for you than for them and all those things that we do. It takes five to ten minutes before we actually get into anything. And so from the very beginning for King Benjamin to capture the attention, I am not here to trifle. These are famous last words. This is a last lecture. This is my dying speech to you. And so what is he asking from them? Verse 9, that you should hearken unto me, to listen with the intent to obey, to open your ears that you may hear, your hearts that you may understand, your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded to your view. Which body parts are we offering to God when he chooses to speak to us through one of his servants? Are the ears all that we're offering? And sometimes not even that. Do we extend to them our hearts and our minds, knowing that they will be speaking to both, since that is the spirit of revelation, when God speaks to the mind and to the heart? Only then will we truly understand God's words. Only then will the mysteries of God be unfolded, which is such a beautiful verb as well. Back in the days when we actually had maps in our car glove compartments, folding them up again was a nightmare because it was so big when it was unfolded, but so small when it was all folded up. And so for God to unfold his mysteries, here a little and there a little, line upon line and precept upon precept. 
gradually we will come to a fuller understanding. But it will require undivided attention of ear and heart and mind. Verse 10, I have not commanded you to come up hither that you should fear me. Later we'll see that they end up fearing, but fearing God, which is Benjamin's intent. I don't want you to think that I of myself am more than a mortal man. In rhetorical studies, speakers are often told to establish their ethos, the authority of the speaker, before they begin to delve into the logos, the power of the argument. King Benjamin has an interesting way of doing that. Rather than trying to make himself some kind of authority, he rests in God's authority and says, I'm no different than you are. Verse 11, I am like as yourselves. I'm subject to all manner of infirmities in body and mind. I'm grateful for the inclusion of both, that physical incapacity and mental incapacity at times afflicts each of us the ups and downs of body and mind. Yet I have been chosen by this people, consecrated by my Father. Here is where the authority comes from. It's not because I'm better. It's because you've chosen me, this people. My Father has passed down the responsibility to me. I was suffered by the hand of the Lord. So this is divine authority as well, that I should be a ruler and a king over this people. And I've been kept and preserved by his matchless power. Why? To rule or reign? No, to serve you. With all the might, mind, and strength of my own, no, which the Lord hath granted unto me. It's amazing how almost insignificant King Benjamin is making his own role in all of this introduction. His was more of a ministry than a reign. And he reminds them of that. Verse 12, I've been suffered to spend my days in your service. I haven't sought your gold or silver. In 13, I haven't confined you in dungeons or made you slaves. And yet at the same time in 13, I haven't suffered you to commit any manner of wickedness. I've taught you to keep the commandments of the Lord in all things. What a difficult balance to strike. To teach obedience, to teach the commandments, to do all that he was able to eliminate wickedness among his people, but at the same time to avoid the kind of strictness or punishment that would confine people to dungeons or make slaves of one another. That's really hard to do. Some of us are the strict disciplinarians that will demand obedience with threats of dungeons and spiritual slavery. Others err on the side of no dungeons, no slavery. You do you, be your own person. And as a result, we tend to minimize the need for obedience or the importance of the commandments of God. Speaking the truth in love is how Paul describes it to the Ephesians. King Benjamin is trying to model that beautifully himself. Verse 14, I myself have labored with mine own hands that I might serve you so that nothing would come upon you which was grievous to be born. And you know that's true, he says at the end of 14. Ye yourselves are witnesses this day. I love that. Is there a way that we can teach one another the commandments of God? Are there ways to exhort obedience that don't make things feel grievous to be born? Is there an attitude shift we can help facilitate in those that we love that obedience and God's commandments and laws are meant for our benefit rather than our burden and that they are not grievous to be born. King Benjamin's doing that beautifully. And he's not doing it, according to verse 15, to boast. I think he's made that clear thus far. This is not about me. I'm not saying this to boast, nor am I saying this to accuse you. I think sometimes when we talk about the way we live our lives, the discipleship or obedience, there comes across either a sense of pride on our part, or the sense of some kind of subtle accusation. Either an I'm doing this and so I'm better, or a you're not doing this, so you're worse. That's not King Benjamin's approach at all. I am like as yourselves. Trying and failing, trying again, falling and getting up, exercising faith in the merits and mercy of Jesus Christ, 
recognizing my own fallen nature, my own infirmities in body and mind and spirit, we could add, and yet trusting in the grace of God, that there is no dungeon awaiting me, that I am no slave to his expectations, that his commandments are not grievous to be borne, but rather his grace is sufficient to make me into someone more like him. That's King Benjamin's approach for himself, it seems, and the approach he hopes to convey to his people. Surprisingly, he hasn't even really begun his sermon yet. This is all introduction. This is all the wind-up before the pitch. But to establish his goal, to prepare his audience, to determine his tone, to explain his authority and his intent, all before the actual meat of his message is presented to his people. I'm amazed already at what King Benjamin has done, even before any of the real words begin to come from his mouth. Now again, remember the result of the message that is about to come forth. From chapter 4, which we just saw, a fall to the earth because of the fear of the Lord. There is a, a deep sense of humility and reliance on the Lord in that moment. Secondly, a change of desires, or at least a, a perfecting of them. A desire for God's mercy, his cleansing blood, a heartfelt desire for righteous things. And finally, faith in Jesus Christ who should come. These are the three great things that resulted from King Benjamin's address. Humility on the part of these hearers, righteous desires welling up within them, and faith in Jesus Christ that those desires could be realized through his grace. In fact, now that I think of it, how could my evangelical friend not love this already? Throughout the history of revivalism, evangelism, it tends to be a focus on our own sinfulness, a desire to change, and trust that that change will only come through Jesus Christ. This is the order. We recognize our hunger, we want food, and we know the source of that sustenance. Just as Ezra Taft Benson used to describe, just as a person doesn't recognize the value of food until he or she is hungry, we don't understand the need for the atonement until we have truly grappled with the fall. Once we have seen ourselves as less than the dust of the earth, there's our humility, recognizing what we want to become instead, there's our righteous desires, we throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus for his enabling grace. That's our faith in him, to be able to bridge the gap between who we are and who we want to become. So that's my biggest question. As we go back to chapter 2 and chapter 3, how does King Benjamin establish humility in his hearers? How does he shift their desire towards true righteousness? And what does he teach them of Jesus to center their faith in him? Let's find out. <laughs> 